All right, this is Ken here. I'd like to take a look at um, the module 131 M310A uh, limits and fan controls. And the focus on this uh, module is primarily on the section, kind of the application, the function, the purpose, the, the requirement, the need for limits and fan controls and how they can help you if there are problems on a system. So we'll be looking at a lot of wiring diagrams um, at some point to look at uh, specifically what is needed to make this functioning uh, correctly. So we're gonna get, um, we'll get started on this. So the first thing that I would hit up on is specifically is the top part, section one. It talks about describe the function of a fan and limit control or fan and limit controls. Well, first thing is the limit controls specifically are one of the big things that you think about when you think about a limit, you're always thinking of something exceeding something, something um, preventing from something from exceeding something such as uh, whether it be temperature or something like that. It could be pressure, it could be temperature, it could be, you know, a number of, of different things. So that's kind of the first thing I think of with that. Obviously, um, equipment safety is one of the big things that we would head up on. So specifically, when we look at, at equipment safety, um, one of the areas that we'll hit up on here, let's get this to work, there we go. All right, so related to the equipment safety, there we go, I gotta get my keyboard dysfunction here. All right, so related to equipment safety, so the question, that I would think of is this. If, if I were thinking of equipment safety, what, what am I trying to prevent? So when I was looking at this particular, uh, at this particular module, the one area that um, I was looking at when I thought about what are some things that limit, you know, that a limit control is designed to do. And one, certainly one of them is the equipment safety, thinking of, you know, how am I protecting the equipment? Um, certainly human safety, equipment efficiency would be another area that would um, play a role in this. So we'll take a look at a couple of things related to, uh, to that specifically. So with equipment safety, now why is this not doing this correctly here? Okay. All right, so related to the equipment safety, I guess the thing that I would always think about is um, obviously limiting the heat exchanger temperature is probably the big thing that I could almost think about um, mainly for that. So let's hit up on some of these. So some of the things that I wanna hit up on is, and I'm gonna just make a question, you know, what about and these things? So specifically, let's think about um, the most common issues that we can run into is plug filters on a job. So whenever, you know, let's say if, if there's an airflow problem, um, somebody has a restricted filter or even an undersize under, you know, the, the filter was not sufficient for the job. Now, you, you know, you might think, well, that should never ever happen if a, a contractor puts a system in and, um, you know, they should design the system correctly. And sure, absolutely they should. But the reality of it is there are, um, there's plenty of systems that get slapped in by contractors that um, put in a system. They might, um, they use a ton of rules of thumbs and things that they used to do. And all of a sudden, before you know it, you run into certain, you know, issues with that. So um, I would say, you know, plug filter, um, undersized um, filters are, that's a, a major issue, a major, major kind of a problem on there um, with those things. And obviously what happens is 
whenever you get plug filters or undersized filters, plug filters is purely dirt. Um, whenever you start getting into um, undersized filter, that's more of a, designed, a design issue. It can even be things like the transitioning um, to a filter that can have an impact on that. Um, uh, obviously, you know, things like this that I could hit up on, there's plenty of them that you could think about, but like um, on a rooftop and even some of the furnaces, you know, uh, a belt, a fan belt break. Um, so if, the, if you get a fan belt that would break, um, that is going to not allow that fan to continue to operate uh, at all. So the motor might be running, but the fan may not be running. So that's kind of an issue that you have to deal with. And yeah, again, all of these are going to create a high temp type application. So the next one that we'll hit up on that is part of this one that I'll, I'll say is essentially um, what happens on some of the condensing furnaces. And that's basically going to be a plugged heat exchanger. Now, you can have it, the, the blockages in a heat exchanger could be external. They could also be internal. And um, again, this is, these are all things that as a technician, you are going to, you're going to see jobs and applications that are going to have both of those. So a plugged heat exchanger, for example, it could be, you could have an internal restriction inside the heat exchanger um, due to sooting or due to some, you know, maybe even due to excessive condensate in some jobs. And on certain applications, that can create that problem. You could get a, um, you know, there can be issues with drafting on jobs. Um, so that's an inability to properly draft. Um, there, again, the, the, there are numerous, numerous um, issues that can run into that. Every one of these things is trying to prevent and generally, when you see these limits, they're usually trying to, to um, protect, let's say, the fan from overheating or the, the motor from overheating or the heat exchanger from overheating or, in some cases, burning up um, coils. Um, so these are, you know, there's a number of things that, uh, that, are, that I would say. And I would say, in, again, this is probably goes without saying, but I would say... Um, you know, a majority of the time, you know, um, we are trying, we're trying to, um, I would say, prevent an over temperature problem. From creating damage to the unit. So from, uh, let's just say, you know, damaging the unit. And there's even more, obviously, that we could get into. But that's just a kind of a little bit of a starter. So let's talk about it from the human safety. So in the, from the human safety standpoint, I think one of the areas that, um, from, the, from a human safety standpoint, I think one of the areas that we can take a look at would be preventing fire from in a building. So, um, you know, and obviously... You know, that's one of the things that we'd be concerned about um, in a, a, a system where, let's say, if, if you, for example, what if you didn't have a limit? Think about that. What if you did not have a high limit? What if you didn't have a limit that would prevent or stop the unit from operating and, um, and to continue to provide heat to a heat exchanger or something? So there are, you could have issues where you, essentially just burn a hole right through the heat exchanger and eventually your, your uh, uh, you know, overheating components and walls and anything that would be, that would be potentially combustible um, could create a little bit of a problem in there. And that's certainly one of those. Um, obviously, um, you know, the, the, the issue that we're talking about is, you know, like, for example, uh, over temperature um, in some jobs, you know, especially like in a in certain applications in a rooftop, for example, um, there are there are things that are basically fire dampers. So um, they can essentially cause some of these fire dampers um, to close. Now, I've seen this on commercial jobs where 
if the if the air temperature going down the the duct system is too high it will cause several of these fusible links to close and it'll block the air off so those are those are essentially a, a fire damper which the intent of that is to prevent any type of air that if there was a fire it would prevent that that unit from continuing to feed oxygen and air to that fire and that's kind of the one thing that would would be an issue on there so that's kind of one of those that we deal with but you know when I think about um, you know if I think about the human safety I think that goes without saying so just you know if you could you can imagine uh, any type of unit that is burning a fuel or it's using electric heat or whatever it might be if anything without limits and without any of these limits and to something overheats you're going to either a burn up something you're going to start something on fire you're, it's something is going to happen and so from a from a human safety standpoint that's without a doubt um, one of the concerns that anybody and everybody should have it's also one of the reasons why um, you know, everybody would pretty much say that, you know, you would, you should never jump a limit out on a permanent basis um, to, because maybe it's, it's overheating or it's tripping or it's doing something. It's clearly telling you there's, there's something wrong. And that's kind of one of those areas that we have to address. So the next one, next area on this one with limits is basically equipment efficiency. And related to the Equipment efficiency, um, I would say um, the one thing that really came to mind for me was, um, in many ways, was, was boilers. And, um, you know, and boilers, what they will oftentimes do is they will have kind of a, let's just call it kind of a, uh, a heat, they'll have an, a heat exchanger, um, let's call it a limit, um, to prevent, um, you know, let's just say, excessive heat. Really kind of, let's say, excessive heat in the, um, in the flue or in the vent pipe. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a number of them that you could hit up on. Now, one of the areas that I would specifically say would be, you know, think about it. If, if you have a... Um, I can think of some of the boilers that they have a, a limit that's called an energy cutoff or an ECO limit. And sometimes what they'll do is this will be a, a, not so much an open close limit, but a more of a transducer or a even a thermistor type of a limit. And what it will do is the thermistor uh, limit, um, what it will do is it'll, the, the boiler system will have an idea of how hot that discharge should be in let's say usually it's the flue gases that they're referring to but it could even be a water temp uh, limit and what they're doing then is um, they will they will stop that unit from functioning should there be an issue specific to to that temperature it's getting up too high uh, now all of those are kind of related to you know whether it's equipment safety or human safety but specific to the efficiency of this they might say, we're going to limit it to no more than 170 degrees, as an example. Um, and in, in one thing that I can, that I can tell you is, is higher flu, I'm just going to say this. So higher flu temps um, basically lead to uh, lower efficiencies. So the idea is that if I can... If I can basically create or, or have my system functioning with lower flu temps to try to make sure that I have proper airflow, proper water flow, um, proper firing rates, if I can do any of those things, um, I, have some, I can have some impact on the efficiency of the system. So that is, that's definitely one of those things that's going on. Now, um, a simple explanation related to that could be if I had a... Uh, I, if I took two systems, two air systems, and one of the systems is running, um, is maybe running another 200 cubic feet of air a minute more than the other system, um, the one system that's moving more airflow would certainly, without a doubt, lead to uh, a better efficiency from the fuel side of things because of the fact that it would be 
pulling more heat or extracting more heat out of that heat exchanger. And it would yield a lower flue temp, which would be better, basically better efficiency on that system. So that's just an example of that. All right, so let's take a look at the next area. And the next one's gonna be on fan controls. Now specific to the, specific to my fan controls. So the one thing that, um, that we hit up on oftentimes is um, with fan controls is the idea is to get, you know, I think of fan control operation as am I improving your system efficiency? Am I, am I increasing comfort to the customer? So those are really the two things. When am I gonna turn on a fan? When am I gonna shut a fan off? Um, how does it affect the customer comfort in these applications? So let's go ahead and hit, hit up on a little bit on these fan controls. So um, the, I think the, the, the note that I would make in here is, I would say it's all about, um, I would say it's all about turning the fan on really about turning the fan on when um, it is really needed. Is the way I would probably see that. Now, um, you know, and, and additionally, I could say, you know, it's not allowing, you know, um, not allowing um, excessive heat to remain in the heat exchanger. Is one um, one one way to look at this. So um, not allowing excessive heat to remain in that. Whoops, in the heat exchanger, not hot exchanger. Okay, let's get that corrected. In the heat exchanger. So one of the areas that, and I would also I would add to that is that also applies to heating. Um, and um, and a cooling. So there are what we do on a lot of these systems is we'll actually have it where we will have a, a we'll have a, a a furnace that will wait till the heat exchanger gets kind of tuned up a little bit, <clears throat> and in the once the heat exchanger gets a little bit warmer, then all of a sudden the fan kicks on. That's one way. Um, because we don't want to have so much heat going out the vent pipe if we're not, if it's not needed. So you got to turn the fan on at an appropriate time. The second thing, which is the more challenging one, is when to turn it off, and that that's really very necessary. When you look at a cooling standpoint from a cooling system, almost every one of these furnaces nowadays, what they're doing is they will, they will actually have a a delay a little bit of a delay start to allow that heat exchanger to kind of get up to temperature or I should say down to temperature. So I'm talking about you're going to run the cooling system, and within 15 seconds or so, if not immediately, but within usually 15 to 30 seconds, those those fans turn on. And then from a post purge standpoint, the on a cooling system, most of those units will will do that as well. Um, they will, they will actually wait um, to shut the fan off. Once the cooling system or cooling call is done, oftentimes a lot of these newer units, they have a post purge time that they provide it or that they give you the ability to do on your cooling side. And it's more of an efficiency thing. So they will essentially um, uh, maybe delay the shutoff of that cooling fan to try to bring more of that heat that from the space allow it to be absorbed by the refrigerant to go, you know, obviously in that coil. So that's really a, a big area to, to deal with. So I'll just make a, a couple of additional notes, you know, as the examples that we just hit up on. One of them is basically the fan on um, and the fan off uh, delays. And that's primarily the big, that's really a big area to, to deal with. So. Anyways, I think every one of those is important in efficiency of the system, um, and that's why they do them. That's why they have those efficiencies uh, that are there. So let's talk about it from the human comfort standpoint. So obviously, you know, we think about it. Why, you know, why doesn't every manufacturer just say, you know what, our heating call is done. Let's just shut the fan off right now. And um, that's 
we know that that would be a huge efficiency detractor. So from a customer standpoint, is there a way that I could, you know, can I, you know, can I make the customer more comfortable? Let's say if I run that fan for a long time after the shutoff or after the heating call is done. Well, that would be the other extreme is that if you just kept the fan running and running and running and you're blowing around all this air, the space becomes a drafty, a drafty type of a deal. So the, the issue that, we're, that we typically deal with with human comfort is mostly, um, usually the examples that we usually offer is basically going to be what I'm going to call fan off delay is probably the most common um, on, a, uh, on a heating system. Those are those are probably by far the the most common the fan off delay on the heating system and again normally um, normally this is um, I would say normally we stop the fan um, I would say when the supply air temp um, drops to let's say to a comfortable level, but I would say if I were to throw a number at it, I would say somewhere between 90 and 100 degrees Fahrenheit is the most common um, off temperatures that we deal with. So um, now of course, in a lot of our systems that we're gonna be talking about, we're gonna look at you know, how do we adjust that and how do we change that and how do we have an impact on, the, on that part of it. But um, the, the note that I would make on there is, you know, I would say the most common complaint of um, condensing furnaces in particular is the draftiness. So how drafty, how drafty are they? You know, they're blowing a bunch of air around and uh, that's, that's somewhat of a concern. And that, that's one of those things that you have to address in fans, on the fan side of things. Now, obviously in a perfect environment, um, you can have some impact by just even looking at where am I, where am I putting uh, diffusers and how are those being, um, how are the diffusers uh, placed within the job? That's an example of one of those. So, um, you know, I'll just put on their diffuser um, placement, you know, in an ideal situation would be great. Um, but again, it has to be in the upfront um, I'll, that's what I'll do. So I'll just put a note in. It must be done. Um, must be done done up front on the jobs. Okay. All right. So that's a little bit on just some of those. So let's talk about the first one of the of the limits that we um, are dealing with. So the first one that I'm gonna that I'm gonna talk about is construction operation application of a helical bimetal fan and limit control. Now. There, this, um, the first one that I'm, that I'm dealing with is without a doubt, uh, the most, I would say it's without a doubt the most, uh, uh, I would say it's the, the first of the limits and the fan controls that were used in our industry was the helical bimetal. And uh, for those of you that are trying to remember or think about what in the world a helical bimetal is, um, on the next page we're gonna be, we'll be uh, showing a couple of those. So I'll just draw, um, I'll just draw a little kind of an example of, of essentially a little helical bimetal. And on the helical bimetals, um, let's see. Okay, so on the helical bimetals, they contain a, let's see, I don't need shapes, we're gonna draw that out. Okay, so on the hel helical bimetal, what they're doing, when, and you think about any bimetal, first of all, um, a bimetal is going to have two dissimilar metals that are gonna be fused together. So I'm just gonna draw this out. So a bimetal So what's happening is they, the helical bimetal is shaped in a manner where we're taking 
you know, two metals that are dissimilar and they're fusing them together. And um, so they're fusing them together. Now, what are they doing that for? So they're fusing them together primarily um, to, because these, you know, different metals will, will expand and contract at a different rate. And what that'll end up causing is a rotation, um, a change in usually it's some sort of a dial um, that has some impact on, on some switches and some cams and things like that. So that's kind of the one, the one area that we'll deal with. So um, I'll make a couple of um, additional notes on this one and uh, sp specific to this. Okay, there we go. So the bimetal, as I had mentioned, it's two metals uh, fused together as one of them. And basically they react to changes in temp. They react to changes in temper, temperature. Um, the one uh, for the, the gentleman in class the other day, um, what we were dealing with was, um, what they were dealing with is if we look at those trainers, um, and I'll just put on there, see, see the gas trainers um, as examples. So, oops. So, the gas trainers all have one of those those gas those gas service trainers that uh, they do. So, all right. So, what are some of the the parts and pieces that are in there? So, internally, what they have is a is as this as this device kind of rotates, as the helical bimetal as it is heating up and it's actually going to be rotating, um, this component that's right there, the bimetal part of it, is actually going to be rotating and it'll be moving. And what happens internally is there are a bunch of cams that actually roll along um, a, some metal pieces on there. And that's, so that's what we're referring to there, those cams. And they're basically, let's just call it the rollers. Now, inside there are also some switches. And the switches on these systems are either gonna be, they're either gonna be switching, um, they're either going to be switching um, the fan or they're going to switch the limit circuit. And we're going to take a look at the wiring and that stuff in a little bit, a little bit later. Um, I will also be talking to you about an internal heater. And um, in particular, um, this internal heater. Okay. So in addition to... Um, what well, there's there's some instances where I would say it's one in um, when in the heat cycle So when they're when we're in that heat cycle um, what they do is they actually will wire that um, heater in parallel To the gas valve so to the main gas valve, technically. So, and uh, it, we call that kind of a, let's call it a time assist um, temperature uh, terminated. So time assist temperature terminated type, type control is what they're doing. So on that one, um, and I'm just going to put a note on there to um, see uh, page five of this module. So I'm just going to bump ahead to page five. So there's two. Um, and specifically, here's page five. Now, this is um, this particular control that I'm referring to or that I'm, a, that I'm uh, dealing with right here is one of the examples that... Um, that we'll be that we'll be kind of kind of dealing with on there, and so this portion right here, and I'm going to circle this. So this, let's see if I can change that to red. So this device there, that little setup in the very middle of this control, that little device on there, that is the what I would say is the resistive heater. Um, that is the.
That's your little resistor heater. The only function of that, and I'm gonna put a note on there, it's only for fan control, and that's all that it's used for. Now, there are, there are a few manufacturers that have used that. Um, it, it is certainly not the ideal um, system, but it's better than the bare bones base helical bimetal, so as an example. So um, essentially for a system like this, the, um, that, that little resistor heater, basically the, the, you know, if you were diagnosing that, it's, it's simply a resistance check. You'd have to obviously isolate and check resistance um, Check resistance um, if you think it is burned out. Now, the reality of it is, I I would I think it'd be challenging. Uh, it would be difficult to identify this unless there would be a problem or a serious problem, serious problem where maybe the the limit is opening up too soon or the the heat exchanger is overheating. And it's, it's, um, that would be the only issue I could think of because it's really only gonna affect the, the, the on time is primarily what, what we're referring to. So um, those notes that I had kind of talked a little bit about, you know, about the heater wires that are connected in parallel to the gas valve to assist in the fan on timing, that's specifically what we're referring to. And again, timed on, temp terminated. And uh, that's kind of the one thing. So that's on page five in that handout. So. All right, let's take a look at, um, let's go back to that page and we're gonna hit up on a couple of additional things. So one of the, um, one of the other areas that we'll deal with on here, okay? And uh, let's talk about operation. So I think the operation is of, um, of the helical bimetal is, is fairly, fairly straightforward. It's a, it's a device that's inserted in the heat exchanger. It is a device that is, um, it's gotta absorb heat, it's gotta pick up heat, it's gotta be able to rotate, it's got to be able to um, turn the fan on at an appropriate temperature, it's gotta shut the fan off at an appropriate temp. It's gotta be able to shut the, the limits um, it's just got to stop the unit from running if we exceed a limit. Um, so, I mean, as far as operation, that's primarily the main thing. But the key thing you have to that I have to point out is on, uh, and I'm going to go back to this thing, is looking at this image on here. This this dial, the operation of it is those bimetals that, or that bimetal. Let me see if I have a picture of that bimetal right here. So. This right here is the visible portion of the bimetal that is shown in here. So that's the visible portion of that bimetal. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that. The whole idea on that is as that heats up, as this thing warms up, let's just say heats up, the expectation is that that dial must rotate. Now, it's got to rotate, and hopefully it, it is able to identify or pick up the, it's able to identify, it's able to pick up the, the heat that's being sensed in that heat exchanger. That would be ideal, what you would want. So that's a little bit on, on kind of what you want it to do. So that's kind of the, the big area on this. So as far as, you know, what, what do we want it to do? Um, certainly, you know, a standard fan and limit control, it's nothing more than a thermal device that is going to um, allow the, the fan to be sensed. No matter what, um, you're providing a limit function. So I'll just put a, the two notes that I would make on there is, you know, I would say it um, needs to provide a limiting function and fan um, control function. And there's multiple ways that that can be done. So that's one. Now, the, the Honeywell time non-temperature terminated, that was the one that I had talked a little bit about So um, prior to this. So let's talk about, let's go back to this, uh, to, that, to that standard uh, limit control. So on a, on a system, on a typical system, what we're gonna do is 
on a typical system, what we're expecting to happen is we're expecting the, the unit to obviously heat up. This thing is going to, let's just say this thing is going to kind of warm up, we'll say. Um, so as this thing starts to get a little warmer, this thing is going to be rotating and it's got to be switching the either either opening up switches and specific to that it's obviously got to turn the fan on when it's appropriate and if the if the fan or the airflow is is not let's say enough it's got to stop the unit from running so you need it to function on that limit side now the only variation uh, the only variation that i would note on here would be this system right here would be the um, would be the ones with the heater. So the time non temperature terminated. So you'll, as you can probably tell, this unit here will, um, as you can probably tell, this unit is um, going, it's, you know, it's going to be mounted right by that heat exchanger. It's going to pick that up. Now, initially, when the initial heating demand is going on, once the main heat exchanger is going, that this little heater is also going to be energized. So that's kind of the one, the one big area to probably to deal with uh, to some extent. So this thing is going to get energized. Now what that's actually going to do, you can see in this case they're showing a set of wires. Um, typically the way that I had seen this in the field was always by, um, by those wires that were going directly to that limit control. But I'm not saying there couldn't be others out there. Um, but that's what they're doing. And essentially the idea of that is that that little extra bit of heat would allow um, it would allow the heat exchanger to to or the fan to turn on a little bit sooner is what it's that's the main thing that would happen. So the only note that I that I'm gonna make on here related to this is there we go. The the note that I would make uh, related to this, there we go is um, with that the Honeywell time non temperature terminated is certainly uh, I'll just say on the the heater oops heater allows the fan to turn on sooner than a standard um, fan slash limit control is the primary way that that's done. So what's what's really, I would say what's very interesting um, related to that is, you know, if it's, yes, it's allowing the heater to turn the fan on sooner um, than, uh, than a typical system. The, the whole reason why, why did they go away from the standard one? Why would you even bother adding that extra little heater in there? And the biggest reason is, um, is is these typically the standard ones they typically provided I'm gonna just say I'll make that comment on your provided poor um, heat exchanger uh, temp control that was the big problem um, that was the problem so if they would have provided better um, there's no reason that Honeywell or any other manufacturer would have put in the the uh, that control now as an advancement later on, um, when they realize that, geez, these things aren't working like we want them to do, um, then they started to go solely to timing. And uh, they still needed to do the limiting portion of it, but at least they had a chance from the fan side they could control that better. So a lot of this is, uh, was really instituted around the changes in the designs of the furnace. So that's kind of the one, the one thing, one area that I would get on there. So, all right, so let's take a look at um, I want to look at number three so it talks about the application so and um, what I want to hit up on here a little bit is in particular is there is a um, bimetal length and location so the one thing I'm gonna that I'm I'm going to uh, we're gonna take a look at this I'm gonna I'm gonna have us I'm gonna just put a little note in here and all right so the, the little note that I'm going to make on there is I'm just going to put it and say, all right, C, um, note um, 23 on the guide. 
And the one area that I'm going to deal with is basically, I'm going to say in this, to use a longer limit if the shorter ones are not available. So what I mean by that is, and you'll, you'll see this as soon as we look at the next page. So, all right, what I want to do is this. All right, so this particular little device or this little handout here. So there is, um, this is just a sample and it was primarily for the purpose of just kind of uh, recognizing that there are a variety of different lengths and of these limit controls. So here's one that we'll, we'll deal with or we'll look at. So for example, if I happen to have, um, let's say, uh, and this was just a sample again, you know, if I happen to have an NUGK um, 075 uh, model as an example, and let me uh, highlight that area. So if I happen to have an NUGK 075, and I'll use, I'll use this one as an example. So on that particular one here, they give us, whoops, they give me an idea of roughly, they're saying um, this particular model, it has a, you know, the first area that it deals with is that I notice is that it's an eight inch limit. So that means from the base of where it connects to the heat exchanger or to the casing of the unit, it would insert into the, in, in between the heat exchanger cells about eight inches. Now, there are several little, um, you'll notice in here, there is a variety of limit temps that are provided in here. So for example, some are 170, some are 180. There's even a few that are in the 250, 220 range. I mean, those are, that's really high um, on some of those things. But they, I think this is one of those where the manufacturer is without a doubt going to know what those limit settings should be um, based on their research and their testing of how that's set up. Um, just as if they're calling for, let's just say if they're calling for a five inch limit and you only have an eight available on your vehicle. Well, that may be, um, that may be what you're going to have to put an eight in instead of that. So the other things that I also want to point out on here is in addition to temps and links is they talk a little bit about position. So the positioning was in this particular handout here, we're talking about, um, for example, position A is in that standard upright. Position B, they're rotating it a certain, you know, uh, 90 degrees from that. Position C is shown at another, as, at another uh, way uh, that they're dealing with this. And the other thing that I'm going to point out is they talk about the shield, this heat shield. And... Um, there are, so you'll notice on the far right, in addition to position, but they'll talk about is the heat shield required or is it not? Now you'll notice a high percentage of these do not have the heat shield provided. And what the heat shield is, it's an actual um, additional piece of metal that is placed on these units. So there are, um, so for example, like I said, they're showing the shield location and um, it's an actual little clip-on piece of, of metal that, that goes on in this thing. So that's kind of the one area. Um, I'll just highlight that a little tiny bit here. But it's a little piece of metal that they send along with these kits. And um, it clips right onto there. And the idea is that, um, I think to some extent what it's trying to do is it's trying to prevent air from running or from traveling right through that limit control which directly would be affecting the operation of that. Um, and uh, so I think that's one of them. And they're also probably trying to limit, to some extent, some of the temperature of the heat exchanger So in addition to that. So uh, there again, this is just a sample. This is just uh, a little bit of that um, that we're addressing or dealing with. Now, you might also notice that some of these also happen to say, does it come with a fan kit or not? So here's a fan kit. And uh, some say yes, some say no. Part of the reason behind that is, um, one, again, one of the issues that we ran into with these limits and fan controls is that they didn't provide very good temperature control of the heat exchanger. So when they went to, when they were providing the fan control using this type of a thermal device, it was very unreliable. And 
it and and primarily it was and you might say well why did they use it way back when well you got to remember one of the things that changed over the years is the design of the heat exchangers so as they as they make the heat exchanger as they make the heat exchangers um, less and less and less and uh, not as as strong and heavy duty that created a little bit of a problem for us so that's kind of one of those so that um, that I would that I would deal with in there. So it's just, like I said, the new heat exchangers are so much lighter than the old heat exchangers, um, just from a mass standpoint and strength. And so it's just, you're way more likely to have a problem on a newer heat exchanger than you would have on an older unit, um, primarily for that, for that particular reason. So, all right, so let's, uh, the last thing we'll finish up this page shortly here is, you know, what's critical on these things. So first thing I would say is this, is, you know, you don't want to modify, you don't want to um, modify manufacturer locations. Um, there's no reason to do that. You don't need the liability. So I'm just going to put on there, do not need the added liability. So that's kind of a, that's kind of a big area on that. Um, so uh, there, there again, um, you know the the manufacturers they know they have an idea what what they should have done you got to leave that on them if they got a bad unit in there um, you should really be talking to the manufacturer if, if they're you know as far as location changing location modifying a limit doing those things the second that you take over control of that and that place burns down you just took on all that liability so it's a major major issue for any contractor to have to deal with all right, so let's talk about um, as far as unit manufacturer specifications. The first thing that I'm going to hit up on, the, the two big ones, is going to be voltage and current um, ratings. That's the big, those are the two big ones that you have to deal with. And then the heat shield, I'm just going to put a note on there, use as required um, by the manufacturer. So, all right, so let's, let's do this. So... The, um, on item B, talks a little bit about contact ratings. So the contact ratings for the limits, the first thing I'm gonna, that I'll address is this. Um, the typical application on the, whoops, there we go. All right, so on the limit, um, most common, the most common limit circuit typically deals with 24 volts with, in most cases. But the limit could be 24, it could be 115, or even 230 volts, depending on how they're doing this. So the limit could be any of those. On the fan side, on the fan side, the fan sides are going to be, um, I would say, are easily uh, rated for 115 volts or I would say, well, not or, I would say actually and um, 230 volts as a general rule. Um, as, a, as a rule, I would say that's probably the most common that you normally are gonna see on there. Now, let's talk about current. All right, so if I think about a limit control circuit, a limit control circuit will most all um, be able to, I would say, handle, um, I would say somewhere around five to seven amps max. Now, I'm not saying you're, you're gonna run that. Whoops, five to seven amps max. So I don't expect any of these systems to, to be running that much amps or that many amps, but the, the controls that I've typically seen have always been able to handle um, that many amps. Now, uh, there again, you're going to run across systems that may or may not, um, so that's kind of one area that we'll deal with. Let's take a look at the next thing. On the fan control side, on the fan control side, I would say they will, um, they will, I would say, will at um, 115 volts, um, I would say they will handle 15 amps as a general rule. 
Now, that's about the limit. I mean, they may see some that will handle more, but you, gotta, you also have to recognize that, um, that you don't expect to see a ton of them that have more than that. In every one of these things, I would say verify, um, verify the ratings. I would say verify the ratings um, if you are replacing unit. And the main thing is verify that you are not exceeding um, the rating limits. Or just say the ratings. We're not exceeding the ratings. So, And I would say that is true. I'm going to just put a note voltage and current. Both of those two, you don't want to be you don't want to be exceeding them. So, and that uh, so that's primarily the the main main thing to, to deal with on that. So, all right, when um, that will conclude this first uh, the first lecture period, um, we're when we come back uh, the next one 